Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you see, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Well, this is an amazing thing that Jesus says as he's walking out. And then in verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. And here's what they, they did. They came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So most of us say that disciples there have asked two questions. And this is the setting in Matthew. It's not the same setting in Mark and Luke, I don't think. So, it's not. So in Matthew, here's the thing. The disciples asked two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? Now you remember, Jesus had been speaking of rebuilding a temple. And he had challenged the rulers, saying, tear down this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. The third day, I will rebuild it in three days. What was he talking about? The temple of his body, which was the true temple, which was the fulfillment of that which that big temple represented. So the disciples want to ask him about this brick temple, this marble temple, this Herod's temple, the second temple, or whatever you want to call it. When will it be destroyed? And then the next question, what, when or what will be the sign of Jesus' coming and the end of the age? What will these things be? I take those things to be the same thing. So I think that you should assume that Jesus' coming and the end of the age are occurring uh, together. And one justification of that is a passage in Hebrews that I'll read for you briefly. On the second question, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 through 28, an unbelievable passage of Scripture where it's going along in the argument of Hebrews, and then at verse 926 he says this, Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often, speaking of Jesus, since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, he, Jesus, the Son of God, has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So Jesus comes once, Jesus comes twice, and the second coming is the end of the age. This is the overall biblical vision of Jesus' coming. So, the disciples ask him these two questions. This is the, the setting for all of this climactic kind of passage here that we're going to study. And Jesus doesn't give some simple, direct answer right away. In other words, he doesn't say, Tuesday. Jesus doesn't say, September 19th. 1988. He doesn't say anything like that. What do, what do modern preachers do though? Oh, I figured it out! Right? Jesus doesn't give a simple direct answer right away. But he begins to explain a larger, obviously more important picture about the future of his people, his disciples. So let's look Matthew chapter 24 beginning at verse 4. And Jesus answered them and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. In other words, beware that you were not led astray. For many will come in my name, in verse 5, saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Why is Jesus warning them? To not be led astray, he's saying, because many will come in my name. So when Jesus said this, he meant they would say that they're coming on his authority. 
This would be similar to where the disciples were sent out by Jesus in Jesus' name. Or it would be like Christians ministering in Jesus' name. Many will say, they are coming in my name. But then he adds something about what such people are claiming in a more progressive way. What are they really saying? It says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Now, hold on a second. Or in Matthew, I think, let me make sure I got this. Mark, it says, I am he. Matthew says, I am the Messiah. And Luke says, I am he, and the time is near. So this is the, the message that these people are, are giving out. Now, I don't know about you, but these days when someone says, I am the Christ, we think they're nuts, right? I mean, we obviously go, sure you are. You know, let's have a seat over here. Um, let's talk about this with the therapist. You know, we don't take that kind of thing very seriously. So how, many, how would anybody be deceived by that? Well, back in Jesus' day, the expectation of the Messiah was a little more of a competitive market. Uh, you would have, there were several people that would come and say, ooh, one famous one that was in the Middle Ages was a guy... Uh, in, in Europe that was just hit. Basically, I think one of his friends became convinced that he was the Messiah. I've told you this story, right? Where he was the Jewish Messiah and he began to go around the synagogues and teach people. And he was, the way I remember it, he was traveling through Turkey and the Muslim official said, so you're the Jewish Messiah. We'd like to talk to you. Can you come to the office, please? So he goes over to the office and, and the authorities are like, okay, here's your choice. You can either... Um, be the Jewish Messiah and you'll be executed. Or you can convert to Islam and we'll give you a job. And so he converted to Islam. So you say, well, was he the Messiah? Apparently not. And, and that guy, he, he upset so many people. <coughs> so many Jewish people were just devastated by that incident. So, you know, different people have done it throughout history. Hopefully today, though, um, we say, well, people wouldn't be deceived by that. But would they? Or would they not? Because these days, people are believing in all kinds of things out there that you and I might think are silly. And there are people coming along that don't really know the history behind a lot of these things. And any, th any kind of miracle or sign or wonder somebody could conjure up, uh, might we might be shocked and how unskeptical some people, that many people are today, unskeptical. So this is what Jesus says they'll do. They'll say, I am He, I am the Messiah. So not only would they claim that Jesus sent them, or that Jesus gave them authority, but they would even claim to be Jesus, or even claim to be the Messiah. And this would be a big claim. Why would this be a huge claim to Jesus' disciples? Because Jesus had already come one time. Like we read in Hebrews, read in Hebrews, Jesus had already come once, the time he was born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. So, but Jesus continues to describe this with that extra line, which I loved, this extra line that clarifies this, saying, the time is near in Luke. I take this to be the same thing. Luke 21, 8 adds the phrase, the time is near. I think this clarifies this. I think we should understand that the people, the people Jesus tells the Christians to be aware of are those who are proclaiming that the time is near. Now I think the time is near. Well, which is it exactly? Put simply, Jesus is talking about the time of the end of the age, which is the time when there will be a great transition that will happen. When, just to uh, cut to the chase, the end of the age is a time of great transition in the world that people know uh, the kingdom of God is going to be transformed into the world in which all glory goes totally to God. In other words, it's going to be radically different than the time we live in now. 
It's going to be the end of the end of this age and the beginning of the age to come. So let's think about this. Who's speaking here? Jesus is speaking. So let's look at exactly what Jesus used to teach. What did he used to say when he was teaching and he was preaching? Because this is not some uh, new thing he's saying to his disciples on this occasion. This fits exactly with what he had always been saying. Jesus' basic message was that he was God the Messiah, and therefore the kingdom of God was arriving in and through his ministry. So it wasn't like he was coming in, you know, proving he was the Messiah. He was the Messiah. And everything, it was like the parting of the Red Sea when he showed up, shows up. Everything changes. Uh, and so the kingdom of God is arriving in and through his ministry. So the message that Jesus preached, if you go back and read all this, I am he, the time is near, therefore you need to do this. I am he, the time is near, do this. Because if the Messiah is here, guess what is also here? The kingdom of God is here also. That was Jesus' message. It's just a fact. So I conclude then that the problem with the many, verse 6, verse 5, Matthew 24, 5, many will come in my name. What's the problem with the many? I mean, wouldn't you be happy if a lot of people came in your name? It seems like you should be. The problem is that they make false claims, number one. Number two, they do this by using Jesus' original message. So they sound just like what Jesus was saying when he was here. So what's the problem? They're not Jesus. They ain't him. And because they are not him, the time isn't near. And furthermore, the time when it was near has already happened. This is a very Baptist sermon. Because Jesus is explaining then the sad results of all this. Many will be led astray. Simply thinking you're Jesus, pretending to be Jesus, acting like Messiah, even copying Jesus' message, which would be good if it were back in Jesus' day, you know, and then saying the time is near is going to lead people astray. Jesus says many will come, many will be led astray. Many and many. Sad, isn't it? It's as if Jesus envisions a sad parade of humanity people both deceiving and being deceived because they've got the wrong guy. They've got the wrong person. They don't understand that the kingdom of God comes in one person, Jesus the Messiah, who suffered and died on the cross and rose again and not anybody else. So Jesus tells them, as if he's looking out at the sad parade of humanity, do not go after them, Luke. 21.8, Jesus says, do not go after them. So it goes without saying that the Lord doesn't want his followers being deceived. He doesn't want them to be led astray from him and his teaching or from a relationship to him. And it appears that fear and alarm and a false vision of the future is what he wants them to avoid because these things create fear. He wants them to have a sure and certain vision of the future. And, you know, just as an aside, I think that a lot of times in the church, uh, different people, I'm not going to name any names, but there's some names in history that have really tripped up a lot of Christians by trying to do things beyond and almost doing the opposite of what Jesus said here. Uh, almost doing the opposite, and maybe not on purpose, but just not by just by maybe not reading carefully, or I don't know, getting carried away. He doesn't want people to fear. So you know, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, I think the opposite of faith is fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Uh, when we're afraid, we're not trusting in God enough, and we're, we're not confident in Him. We're not confident in His promises. And, and remember, Jesus very often said, do not worry about tomorrow. That's what he kept saying. 
Trust in me. Don't worry about tomorrow. I mean, you know the Sermon on the Mount. You know these things that Jesus said in his compassion. He didn't say on, on, on let's, say, let's say, Sunday afternoon, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. And then Monday he said, panic! You've got to figure out the end times right away or you're going to be deceived. Do you think that's what Jesus did? No. So as we read this passage, there are two obvious concerns. The first one is kind of long. The first one, Jesus is saying that the first coming doesn't happen twice. We've got to get that through our skulls. The first coming of Jesus doesn't happen two times. You read that in Hebrews, and it's confirmed right here. And you may say, what is he talking about? Because this is what some people are looking for. They're looking for the first coming of Jesus again. In some sense, the end of the age has already dawned the first time Jesus came. So it will not dawn again for a total of two dawns. With apologies to dawn. I mean, we have one dawn here. So we could have two dawns. The dawning of the kingdom of God and then dawn. But... The point is that the first coming is only going to happen once. It is silly to think that the kingdom of God has not already started. It has already begun. It has already been announced. It has already been inaugurated. Well, when was that? That was when Jesus came the first time. He said, I am He. The kingdom of God is here. It is upon you. It is near. He told people that you can't believe He told them this. That he told them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And they're going, oh, I'm not. You know, it's in him and in his ministry. It has already started. It is imminent. It is near. It is upon you, as Jesus said. Yet, the many <laughs> deceivers, the many deceivers that are mentioned here, behave as if they are announcing it for the first time. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you can hear people speaking in Jesus' name and they're speaking as if nothing has ever happened before they got up there and started talking. There's no sense of history. There's no credit for Christ and what He's done. There is only today and what you're going to do now. It's works righteousness, legalism, make it up as you go along and do whatever works. It's not about Jesus and what He did. We've got to be careful. It is not right to behave as if the kingdom of God has just started. To behave as if it has just begun for the first time. If someone claims that Jesus sent them, or even that they are Jesus, or that the end is therefore near because they're now born, we can inform them that they're 2,000 years too late. That the end started 2,000 years ago. So that's the first concern. The first concern is that the first coming doesn't happen twice. So the second concern is, and this is, we know this one, but I'm going to emphasize it. Jesus is saying that his second coming won't be like the first in quality or in content. In other words, when Jesus comes the second time, he's not going to say, I am here, I am he, and the time is near. He's not going to say that. He's not going to announce this. Why would he need to say that? Because everybody is going to experience it. Everybody is going to know that he is he and that the time has arrived, the consummation of the age, of this age, and the beginning of the age to come. So in other words, when Jesus returns, we'll all know it. Okay? And when the kingdom of God is consummated and comes in its fullness, we will all know it. Jesus is not going to be sitting on the Mount of Olives with, you know, a few of his disciples having a nice, quiet, probably boiled fish lunch. Uh, it's going to be a whole different ballgame. Remember where this comes from. One of the big backdrops for this whole section of Scripture, I'm still trying to figure out Zechariah. But one of the big easy ones to find is the book of Daniel. 
Y'all know. And, and, and one thing that happens, I wonder if I mark this. Well, I'll do the quote because I have that marked. The quote that backs all this up and this is another dramatic occasion when Jesus is on trial, his mock trial, before the high priests. Remember, Jesus is keeping silent. He doesn't answer in his trial. Again, the high priest questions him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And in Mark 14, 62, Jesus said this, I am and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. What is Jesus quoting? He's quoting from Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 that the second coming is going to be public, seen, obvious, and known. It won't be some secret only known to religion reporters from Time Magazine. It will be public. So, do people get led astray today? Well, it depends on what you're led astray from, I guess. And Jesus' point is that we don't get led astray from Him, which assumes we're with Jesus to start with. With Him personally. And one big, big thing that all the skeptics love to talk about today, and I'll admit I like to think about it too, but one of the big things that leads people astray is the seeming delay of Jesus' coming. And we know that in the Old Testament, one of the big themes is, How long, Lord? How long, O Lord, will you wait? The general tone of Jesus' warning to the disciples, I believe, in these passages, is that the delay is planned and that the, the delay will be significant. And that we need to pay attention to the delay because Jesus begins to teach them here that this is going to be a long process. I think, you know, you imagine, and if you see the movie sometimes, you think, well, this is, the disciples sort of thought Jesus is one of Finish all this up in a couple of weeks, and then we'll get on to the, you know, get on to the classic car show or whatever. But Jesus is explaining that this is going to be a process. This is going to be a long process, and uh, we should pay attention to this. So look how he begins to explain this. I think in verse six, Matthew chapter twenty-four, verse six, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. So, we interpret this often as wars and insurrections, conflict, uh, maybe news of wars in other places. And <clears throat> what is his response to that? Don't be alarmed. Or terrified. I don't know about you, but something that bothers most humans is a war. Uh, you know, it's kind of a problem. Uh, war and insurrection can be an issue. Uh, we don't want to go there. Uh, most of the time, we'd like to avoid the area unless it's our job or our duty to go there. Uh, he says, don't be alarmed or terrified. Now, I want to say this. War in the ancient world was brutal and life-altering. As I have, you know, read about some of these things uh, in ancient history, it is astonishing the brutality and the horrific loss of life that was experienced uh, back in these days. Uh, I was just reading somewhere in preparation for all this, in just one Jewish conflict with the Romans, I think this was Hadrian, so this would have been 160s, somewhere in there. And the, this was five, maybe something like 580,000 Jewish people were killed just in this one conflict. So you're talking about uh, brutal, 
Now we, on the other hand, are used to wars being over there. More or less used to the boys coming home from the war. But you know, in Jesus' day, especially in Roman Palestine, ugh, a tense place, uh, you know, especially around urban areas, war and insurrection was total. It was horrible. And it affected everybody in an extremely immediate way. Uh, and I won't give you a lot of details, but there was just a few of these conflicts around the biblical days. The Maccabean Revolt, 167 B.C. Then you have the Roman occupation of Palestine. All the conflicts and insurrections that went on there. And then you have something Jesus is getting ready to refer specifically to. The siege of Jerusalem and that climax of that Jewish war there when Jerusalem was sieged. Then the destruction of the temple. And then the siege of Masada. And then later the Bar Kokhba wars after that. So uh, don't think that Palestine was some peaceful little place and that when Jesus said wars and rumors of wars, those people sitting there and their families and their friends would be affected and had been affected personally by the wars and insurrections. And yet, what does Jesus say about that? The end is not yet. So, should Christians be alarmed or terrified by the end of the age? It seems that Jesus never gives Christians a good reason to be alarmed, even in spite of wars and rumors of wars. And he gives us one big reason not to be alarmed and terrified. And that is because uh, God is in control of the end of the age. So Jesus' followers are aware that some things that uh, are going to happen in their lifetimes and other things are not. And one of those, uh, uh, the end of the age is not one of those things that's going to occur during the lifetime of Jesus' first disciples. So look at verse 7. He says in Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. So, nations are going to clash. Kingdoms will clash together in military conflict. But not only this, Jesus explains that there will be natural disasters. Luke chapter 21, verse 11. I love the way this sounds just like Luke. Uh, that there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. So uh, Jesus emphasized those things as well. Dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. We translate in English. I think that sounds fun. And then verse 8. In spite of all those things, what is Jesus' summary statement at the very end in Matthew and Mark? He says, all of this is what? But the beginning of the birth pains or the beginning of sorrows. So this is a clear reminder to us that God has involved us in a process when he says this is just merely the beginning. And he's going to go on to explain some more things as we'll see in the weeks to come. So there's a history. There is a plan of redemption. God has and is acting in and through history to bring us to Himself, to bring about salvation, glorification, and restoration. And I should also point out that this is a plan and a process that is personal. Jesus is involved in this. God is involved in this in a compassionate way as He speaks to His disciples and to us. He wants us to know that there is nothing to fear. He wants us to know that we are to be watching and observing and seeing the signs of the end of the age. So we can have confidence. We can have confidence in God and in Christ for the future. Let's pray together. Lord, we do pray that no one in this room would be led astray. We pray, Lord, that Christians who are trying to read your word and be faithful to you and trying to understand you would not be carried away that we would understand the, the amazing difference between your first and second, second coming, that we are living 
and the overlapping of the ages, and that it is time for us to realize that you have brought your kingdom to the world 2,000 years ago, and that you are yet still in the future going to bring about its fullness. Lord, we pray that today, if there is anyone here who has not joined you in your kingdom, if they have not trusted you as their Lord and Savior, if they have not gotten right with you and given up their sins so that they can be prepared for that final day, Lord, we pray that today would be the day of their salvation. So, Lord, we ask for your help in this. We ask for you to bless each person here and speak to us now as we sing our final song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.